word of prayer and get started. Thank you, Lord, for this time and opportunity we have to gather. We thank you for your word. Thank you for the truth that it is and that we can go in it and see that truth and be edified and built up by it as we rightly divide it. And in so doing, we know that all things that we have, our relationship with you, our position with you, our hope with you is all done through Jesus Christ, our Savior, who loved us and gave himself for us so that we could have eternal life. I thank you for those that are here. I thank you for those that have tuned in. pray that the study tonight will give them insight and understanding of your word and the working that you do and uh, have us better equipped to uh, tell others about the truth. And uh, we give you thanks and praise for these things. In Christ's name, amen. All right. Um, turn to Second Corinthians. Second Corinthians chapter 4. <coughs> now in Second Corinthians chapter 4, look with me in verse 1. It says, Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves in every, to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost in whom the God of this world had blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who commended the light to shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Obviously, I could preach on each verse and take up um, weeks on that. But what I'm focused in on is a verse that <clears throat> gets quoted quite often. Uh, I see a lot of people make statements about it, and that is verse, uh, is verse 4. But let's read verse 3 first. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, verse 4 in whom the God of this world had blinded the minds of them which believed not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. So in verse 4, first of all, you see the word God there, and since it's a lowercase g, it tells you that it is not the God of heaven and earth, but it's the devil. Uh, he is the God of this world, and he works a religious uh, operation in this world, and um, he is trying to sow discord among the brethren, and he tries to preach a corrupted truth, which he has done starting as far back as the garden. So uh, people use this verse a lot of times in addressing in whom the God of this world had blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of glorious gospel of Christ, uh, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. And... What I want to show you about this verse is its context. All verses have a context. It's talking about something in specific. So there's a context here. Now there are verses you can take really out of context and make a me message out of it. And I said that last week. Like I could take John 3.16, which religiously, the Christians of religion believe that that's the gospel. That's not the gospel but I could use it in a gospel message because I know the truth and would know how to use it to where somebody could get saved. Um, so there's a context involved in this, and I want to show you the context of what Paul's writing here. But to do it, I decided rather than just jump in there and explain it, I decided that I want to lead some things up to you so when we get to it, it's more of a ta-da thing, you know, ta-da type thing, instead of, oh, yeah, yeah, okay, okay, and I threw it out there real quick. So that's the reason why we're going through this process here. Like, for instance, last week, we had discussed the situation in, uh, back there during the days of Elijah. Now, when I talk about Elijah, and we're back there in 1 Kings, you're going to go, well, what does Elijah back in 1 Kings has to do with this verse? Well, it has to do with a lot. 
but it's in an d- indirect path. It's not like a straight line, but you have to see the path to see how it connects with verse 4. So, with that said, let's do, a, I guess, a little review and go back to 1 Kings. So turn back there to 1 Kings. We won't need 2 Corinthians tonight. But 1 Kings chapter 19. First Kings 19. Now, I addressed last week that we have some players involved here. And one is uh, Ahab. He's a king of Israel. And he's got a wife named Jezebel. And uh, she's a bad one. And King Ahab was too. The prophet of that, that day is Elijah. Um, so that's the main characters there. And Jezebel had through her idolatrous worship, uh, kind of twisted or, or got Ahab to her husband into idolatry, which uh, the king then, Ahab, brought idolatry into Israel. And so she had some prophets, her own prophets, 450, and ultimately Elijah... Uh, got the upper hand on them and led them out to a creek and killed them all, 450. So, with that said, that's what's happened up to the point that we're going to read. And so Ahab brings that report of her prophets being killed by Elijah. And in chapter 19 of 1 Kings, verse 1, And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, and withal how he had slain all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And when he saw that, he arose and went for his life, and came to Beersheba, where belongeth to Judah, left his servant there. So Jezebel hears what Elijah did to her prophets. She's a tiny bit upset about it. (laughs) And so she said, okay, well, I'll die too. But I can tell you that I've got a hit put on you, and by tomorrow at this time you will be dead. So she sent a messenger to find Elijah and bring that report to him. And once he got that report, what did it say that he did? said that in verse 3, and when he saw that, he arose and went for his life. So he's running away. Why? He wants to protect himself, right? Wants to stay alive. Well, let me show you what God deals with. This is a prophet, great man of God. So he runs away because he doesn't want to be killed. So he runs away, and in verse 4, but he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree, and he requested for himself that he might die. (laughs) Do you see any irony in that? If he wanted to die, just go visit Jezebel. She would oblige you. Well, he's kind of having a little pity party. So he runs away from Jezebel because he's scared he's going to get killed by her. Then he goes under a juniper tree and crawls up under there and says a prayer, you know, like Paul says in uh, Philippians, make your request known unto God. Well, he made a request for himself that he might die (laughs) and said, it is enough now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am not better than my father. So he's under there having that pity party, and the angel comes and feeds him, and he's got to go on a journey. So we'll go down to verse 8. And he arose and did eat and drink and went in the strength of that meat forty days, forty nights unto Horeb, the mount of God. And he came thither into a cave and lodged there. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. And he said unto him, What doest thou here, Elijah? In other words, why are you up in this cave? And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts. For the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword, and I, even I only, am left. And they seek my life to take it away. And he said, Go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord. 
And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind rent the mountains, and break in pieces the rock before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a small, a still, small voice. And that's pretty much how God works. He doesn't have to yell and scream and holler. His, his word is uh, solid at any level. And it was so when Elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entering in of the cave. And behold, there came, down a, came a voice unto him and said, What doest thou here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very jealous of the Lord God of hosts because the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. And the Lord said unto him, Go, return on thy way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when thou comest, anoint Hazel to be king over Syria. And Jehu, the son of Nimshi, shalt thou anoint to be king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of uh, Shaphat, of Abel-Meholah, uh, shalt thou anoint to be the prophet in thy room. And it shall come to pass that him that escapeth the sword of Hazel, which is in Syria, shall Jehu slay, which is Israel. And him that escapeth the sword of Jehu in Israel shall Elijah slay. So there's a three-headed attack thing going on there. Then he says, Yet have I left me 7,000 in Israel, all the knees which have not bowed unto Baal, and every mouth which is not kissed him. So we see that as Elijah went in there and fought basically against Jezebel and her priest, against that corrupt, uh, idolatrous worship there, and Elijah ultimately killed 450 of the prophets of Jezebel, that in all of that, even though Israel was deep into idolatry, into Baal worship, God told him that there were 7,000 people, 7,000 that have not bowed the knee unto Baal nor kissed him. So there were 7,000 somewhere in there that the whole purpose of Elijah being sent there by God was for these 7,000. That's the purpose. Elijah was sent for that 7,000 and that needs to be kept in your mind. Now, uh, with that said, let's look at Paul's ministry. And what I'm trying to do is kind of a, do a little here and a little there to where at the end you kind of see a pattern that has developed. So look in Acts chapter 13. Look with me in Acts 13. In Acts 13, look in verse 14. And when they departed from Perga, they came to Antioch in Pisidia and went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and sat down. And after the reading of the law, the prophets and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue, sent unto them, saying, Ye men and brethren, if any have word of exhortation for the people, say on. Then Paul stood up. And beckoning with his hand, said, Men of Israel, and ye that fear God, give audience. So he's in the synagogue, and he's given the opportunity to start preaching. So Paul stands up and starts preaching. And verses uh, all through there um, go all the way to verse 42. I'm not covering what he preached, because it's not my point tonight to cover what he preached. Verse 42, And when the Jews were gone out of the synagogue, the Gentiles besought that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. <clears throat> now when the congregation was broken up, many of the Jews and religious proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who, speaking to them, persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. And the next Sabbath came almost the whole city together to hear the word of, word of God. But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy and spake against those things which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. So they're 
pretty upset about this. As a matter of fact, if you go down to verse 50, go down to verse 50 and see the unbelieving Jews' reaction. But the Jews stirred up the devout and honorable women and the chief men of the city and raised persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them out of their coast. All right, we're going to see a pattern here. Paul gets to the city. He goes into the synagogue. He preaches about Jesus Christ. There are some Gentiles that believe. There are Jews that believe. But there are Jews that don't believe. And the Jews that don't believe get aggressive and basically try to throw him out of the city, which basically they did. Uh, down in verse uh, chapter 14 now, establishing a pattern of Paul and his ministry, the Apostle Paul. Verse 1, And it came to pass in Iconium that they went both together into the synagogue of the Jews, and so spake that a great multitude, both of the Jews and also of the Greeks, believed. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and made their minds evil, affected against the brethren. So we see there's trouble there now at Iconium. Look over in chapter 17. Chapter 17, verse 1. Now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where was the synagogue of the Jews. And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them, and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out the Scriptures, opening a legend that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus whom I preach unto you is Christ. And some of them believed and consorted with Paul and Silas, and of the devout Greeks a great multitude, and the chief women not a few. But the Jews which believed not, moved with envy, took unto them certain lewd fellows of the baser sort, and gathered a company, and set all the city on an uproar, and assaulted the house of Jason, sought to bring them out to the people. So the Jews that didn't believe, same thing in this city of Thessalonica. They didn't believe going after Paul and his people. Uh, look in chapter 18. Going after a little bit of a pattern here. Chapter 18. Look with me in verse 4. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. And when Silas and Timotheus would come from Macedonia, Paul was pressed in the spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus was Christ. And when they opposed themselves and blasphemed, he shook his raiment and said unto them, Your blood be on your own hand, I'm heads, and I'm clean. From henceforth I'll go uh, unto the Gentiles. So you even see in that pattern, it's not so much that they went after him, but trust me, they were not welcoming to him anymore. The unbelieving Jews, once he went there and preached to them, uh, they rejected him and... Uh, really wanted to kill him. I mean, you'll see a bunch of accounts where they tried to kill Paul. So there are a couple things we see. One of the things that we do see is that as Paul began his ministry, <clears throat> which Paul's salvation took place in Acts chapter 9. So he got saved there. Now when he began his ministry... Uh, he lays something out there that we need to make sure we know and understand if we don't already, and that can be found in Romans chapter 1. So turn to Romans chapter 1. And in Romans chapter 1, look with me in verse 16. He said, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. So there's kind of a priority that took place there with him preaching the gospel of Christ. What is the gospel of Christ? Well, the good news that he was preaching is that Christ, when he hung on the cross, he was dying and did die for our sins. He preached that he was buried and that he was raised again the third day for our justification. That's the good news then, and that's the good news today. So if someone's going to be forgiven, if someone's going to be saved today, it's not based on how good you are, it's based on your faith in Jesus Christ. 
If there were good people that would just go to heaven because they're good, then Christ's death would have been in vain. So by his death, it testifies to the world that none of us are any good, else God would have never sent his son to the cross. So Paul preached this truth, this gospel, and he said in Romans 1 that it went to the Jew first. The Jew first. Now, turn with me to Romans chapter 11. Look with me in Romans 11. <clears throat> in Romans 11, look with me down in verse 11. He says, I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? Now, the word they there is a reference to the Jews. That's who the they there is. I could say, have the Jews stumbled that they should fall? And that's who he's talking about, just to let you know. So verse 11, have they, I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid, but rather through their fall salvation has come to the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. So there's, the, the verse is kind of contradictory if you don't get in there and study it because of the way it's worded. For instance, it says, Have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid. So that tells you, no, they didn't fall. He says, but rather through their fall, salvation has come to the Gentiles. Well, the fall there is from two different Greek words. The first fall would be like if you tripped and fell off a cliff. That would be how that fall implies that you're done, that you've fallen flat on your face. This fall here, he says, but rather through their fall, salvation has come to the Gentiles. That fall lines up with a word in the next verse. So follow me, the next verse. Now if the fall of them be the riches of the world, and the diminishing of them, which is the Jews, the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness. What Paul is saying is that even though when he begins his ministry, it went to the Jew first, but in the pro progress of his ministry, through the account of Acts, during that time, the Jews were going into a falling position. In other words, it's kind of like you're, you're slipping down rather than just abruptly on your face. It was a diminishing he talked about. The diminishing of them, which has to do with a decrease or a loss. You know, your investments in stocks and bonds or stocks, you know, uh, if the stocks go down, it's diminishing returns. Basically, you're not getting as much anymore, you know. So they're diminishing. So Israel's position with God, even though he took Paul, the apostle, and sent him to the Jew first, they were in a process through the account of the book of Acts as falling or diminishing. So that's very important to see because ultimately God is going to change the program. So we see that they're falling and that they're diminishing. So, with that having been said, um, look, I want to point some things out to the suffering of Paul that will tie into this. Look with me in Acts chapter 20, keeping in mind he was called to go to the Jew first. Let's look at a few verses here. Acts 20, verse 19. Serving the Lord with all humility of mind and with many tears and temptation which befell me by the lying in wait of unbelievers, of Gentiles. Who was lying in wait? The Jews. So think about this. He is bringing this gospel to the Jew first. 
But there were unbelieving Jews that gave him problems. Look in Acts 23. Acts 23, go down to verse 12. And when it was day, certain of the Jews banded together and bound themselves under a curse, saying that they would neither eat nor drink till they had killed Paul. That's pretty much a determination, huh? A group of grown men sitting around hating this guy so much and so bad that they take a vow that we're not going to eat or drink till we have killed Paul. Now, if they held to that vow, they died of starvation or thirst, or both, because they never killed Paul. But that was their vow. That shows you the, the, the determination of the Jews. Look with me in 1 Thessalonians. Look in 1 Thessalonians and go to chapter 2. First Thessalonians chapter 2. Look with me in verse 14. For ye, brethren, became followers of the churches of God, which in Judea are in Christ Jesus. For ye also have suffered like things of your own countrymen, which, uh, I'm sorry, even as they have of the Jews, who both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets and persecuted us. And they please not God and are contrary to all men. So we see there's a comment about the Jews and their persecution. Let's see what they did to Paul. Turn to 2 Corinthians. Look in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Paul lays out a lot here relative to what he has endured for the preaching that he did, which none of us today can even come close to. Now, the context is what the unbelieving Jews did to him, so I'm not going to read all the verses. So what I want is one verse there that tells you specifically. 2 Corinthians 11, look with me in verse 24. Of the Jews, five times received our forty stripes, save one. So five times he received 39 lashings, whippings, which if you take, I did the math there, 35, 39 times five is 195 beatings he took with a whip or a cane or a rod or something to that extent, a whipping, uh, the stripes that were put on him. I would imagine when Paul went to some of these places, and he preached there, and you had the saints there, that this guy was really a rough-looking character. Acts chapter 14 accounts that he was stoned, and they took him, up, took him up as dead. He lived. I'm sure there was some disfigurement there and broken bones, and, you know, the old, you know boxers get these, they call it cauliflower ears and nose off to the side. I mean, I imagine the guy was a tough look because he took such a beating in his body. Uh, as a matter of fact, he told the Colossians that he suffered uh, the sufferings of Jesus Christ in his body for us. So he was a chosen vessel to go through this type of punishment. Nonetheless, it didn't ease the pain and the suffering that he went through. And what we've seen is that he's gone through most of this suffering and pain by the unbelieving Jews keeping in mind that God sent him to the Jew first, in spite of the fact that the unbelieving Jews would treat him the way they did, so physically hurt, and then take a vow to kill him. So they were determined to kill this guy and get rid of him. Now, look in Romans, go back to Romans. And look in chapter 9 of Romans. Well, before we go there, yeah, chapter 9 of Romans, look with me in verse 1. 
He says, I say the truth in Christ, Romans 9, 1. I lie not, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost, that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. For I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh, who are Israelites. Even though he was treated the way he was, he had continual sorrow and great heaviness in his heart for those Jews. Even though he was treated that way. Now, you know, I see a lot of people talking about how we're to follow Paul, and I believe we ought to. But there's more to following Paul than just on a doctrinal thing of we don't baptize, we don't confess our sins, you know, and different things like that, even though all that's true and all of that is necessary. But I would challenge you to follow Paul the same way Paul expressed his way here, in that being treated the way he was treated by those Jews he still had continual sorrow in his heart for them to be saved. That's love. That's love. You think about it when someone wrongs you, rather than striking back, getting even, or any of those things, have the heart that Paul had and have a love for them that if they're saved, they would grow in the grace of God. Have that type mi mindset. It's very difficult to do. But I can tell you this, it's not impossible. Because Paul did it right here. So, he had a great heaviness for those Jews, even though they were after him. Five times I received 40 stripes, save one. That's 195 beatings by the Jews. And he still had heaviness and continual sorrow in his heart for them to be saved. So in chapter 9... Look over um, in verse 29. And as Isaiah said before, this is Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah he's talking about, except the Lord of Sabbath had left us a seed, we had been as Sodom and had been made like unto Gomorrah. Now what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah? Destroyed, right? God brought down the fire and destroyed Sodom, Gomorrah, and some cities that were round about that area because of the wickedness that was going on. So he destroyed them. So Isaiah's saying that had there not been a seed, we would have been like Sodom and Gomorrah. So Isaiah is living in a time when Israel once again went into idolatry. Look back in Isaiah chapter 1. Look in Isaiah 1. Now this is what Paul in Romans 9 was quoting. In, Rome, in Isaiah 1, Verse 9, except the Lord of hosts had left unto us a very small remnant, we should have been as Sodom, and we should have been like unto Gomorrah. So why weren't they in the days of Isaiah made like Sodom and Gomorrah? Why didn't God just kill them? Because there was a remnant. There was a remnant. God, during the days of Elijah, could have called the fire down and destroyed all Israel. But what did God tell Elijah? Elijah, there are 7,000 that have not bowed the knee to Baal nor kissed him. In other words, he's not going to rain his anger and his wrath down and take out the godly with the ungodly. He's not going to do it. He didn't do it with Elijah. And he's telling Isaiah, or Isaiah's prophesying about it, that had there not been a remnant, we would have been like Sodom and Gomorrah. And that's what Paul is quoting. So when you see Paul quoting here, in this dispensation of grace that we're living in, 
there's something that's got to be going on in his life that connects back to the writing of Isaiah. It's got to be there. So we're going to find it. Go back to Romans. I had one of those <clears throat> pretty much up most of the night last night with that sinus and medication. And I'm studying and reading this thing and I'm going doing the whole head bob deal, you know? So now there are two bobbin head marks in the house. <laughs> I just, and I'm like, we can do this, we can do this. It's like walking in the fog. Either you're going to make through it or you're going to run into something, but you're going to walk, right? So here we go. Romans chapter 11. I don't know if I got the chapter to you. Did I? That should key you off right there. Romans 11. Look in verse 1. Paul says, I say then, had God cast away his people? Answer, God forbid. For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God had not cast away his people, which he foreknew. So he says, did God cast away his people? Couldn't have happened. Now we're talking about in this age today. This is the Jews as they're falling. Paul got saved in Acts 9. Go to the Jew first. So did God cast away his people? Paul says, God forbid. Why? Because I am one. If he had cast them away, I could have never gotten saved. So God forbid. So Paul is an example of the believing Jew here. So he took that gospel... Christ died for our sins, was buried and raised again. He took that truth and began preaching it to the Jews. And there were Jews that believed. There were also Jews that didn't believe him. We saw the consequence of what took place. He was treated pretty bad. He was hurt, beat up. So let's continue to read here. Verse 2, God had not cast away his people which he foreknew, what you not what the, what the scripture saith of Elias? You know who that is? Elijah. Remember, we've been reading Elijah. Now your mind's got to go back to last week a little. How he, Elijah, maketh intercession to God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed thy prophets and dig down thine altars, and I am left alone, and they seek my life. You remember he said it, the Lord told Elijah that twice. I'm sorry, I got that backwards, there you go. The Lord said twice, he said, Elijah, what are you doing here? He was in a cave. He said, and he quotes this verse here, Lord, they've broken that covenant, they've dug down that altar, they have killed the prophets, and I'm left alone, now they seek my life. That took place twice. Verse 4, But what saith the answer of God unto him, unto Elijah? He said, I have reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. You remember that? So then, what he's telling Elijah is that, Elijah, I need you to go in there, face Jezebel, face the prophets, kill those prophets, and I'm going to preserve you through this. Why? I'm going to do it for the 7,000 that are there. I'm not going to let you die. I need you to get those guys out. But man gets in fear. You know, he ran off and hid under a juniper tree and prayed that God, just take my life, God. But he's not gonna, God's not going to allow that to happen. Now, isn't it a little ironic that you go from both quote Isaiah and the storyline of Elijah and Paul is using it over here. So whatever Paul is going through, 
those storylines back here apply over here. That's why he's talking about it. So there were 7,000. Now watch the next verse. This is the key. Even so then, at this present time also, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. Well, we know that we're living in the dispensation of the grace of God. Paul said, even though now there is a remnant according to the election of grace. This is what God is telling Paul. Paul, I want you to go to the Jew first to preach that gospel. And he suffered greatly for it by the unbelieving Jews. That's why we covered that. But he drew, absorbed, off of the storyline of Elijah. God gave him insight to the ministry of Elijah and what Elijah went through for the 7,000. So he says, even so now, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. God foreknew. Had God cast away his people? God forbid. God did not cast away his people for who he foreknew. So that tells me, before the foundation of the world, that God could look through time, thousands of years, see this gospel, and see that if he gives it to the Apostle Paul, he would believe it. He could see that. So, he could also see within the community of the Jews, where he sent Paul first, he saw that there were those that if the gospel went there, they would believe it. So Paul knew that he was sent into this hornet's nest, the Jews, to get out the remnant, just like Elijah was sent to get the 7,000, to secure the 7,000. So there's a remnant that was there according to the election of grace. That's why Paul was sent to the Jew first. That's the reason. Now, in the process of the book of Acts, carrying out that shows his progress of ministry, during that course, the Jews began to fall. Meaning he was getting more and more of the remnant out until there were no more. There were no more. Look in Romans chapter 9. I'm sorry, no, no, no. Romans 11. Romans 11, sorry about that. These verses we read. Verse 11. I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid. But rather through their fall, salvation is come unto the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. In other words, God is now, through Paul, extending salvation to Gentiles during this time to get these Jews jealous. Wait a minute. He's our God. We're His people. And He's going to those Gentiles, and they get jealous about it. And it would have provo provoked them to receive Paul when he got to their city. But through their stubbornness, their stiff neck, as it called, hardness of heart, when Paul would get to those cities, they were waiting on him. The unbelieving Jews were there, and they were ready to take him out. So Paul was going into those cities to get that remnant of Jews out. And oh, by the way, when he preached the gospel, there were some that believed, and there were some Gentiles. And God used this salvation of these Gentiles to provoke the other Jews into believing the gospel. But ultimately, that didn't work. So, he raised up Paul in verse 13. He says, For I speak to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify my office. So then, 
the fall of Israel ultimately led to the riches of the Gentiles diminishing like your monies are diminishing riches of the Gentiles then Paul became an apostle of the Gentiles I magnify my office so Paul saw something when he wrote Romans which was about Acts 20 we won't go into that but just to give you an idea he started to see some changing going on he started to see that his ministry to the Jew first was diminishing out his ministry to the Jew first was fading out why because he was faced with more and more persecution where word of Paul got to that city from the Jews before he got there. And when he got there, they were waiting on him. And so it basically got to a point where he couldn't go anywhere. So the Jews, through their persecution, forced him into the Roman powers at that time. And he was delivered up to the king and did his position... Uh, did his testimony before the king, gave his account of his ministry, and the Jews that were accusing him, those Romans are like, you guys are killed. Are you kidding me? This guy has done nothing worthy of death. So basically, the Roman powers take him, and he's headed up to Rome, where he finishes out his life, in his own hired house. Turn to Acts. Uh, let's see. Um, no. Yeah, turn to Acts and look in Acts 28. Acts 28. Look in verse 16. <clears throat> He says, and when we were come to Rome, the centurion delivered the prisoners to the captain of the guard. But Paul was suffered to dwell by himself with a soldier that kept him. I'd like to do a message on the blessed soldier. You think about it a minute. Rome was a world power. These guys were all over the world at that time. They fought great battles. These soldiers are out there enduring the harshness of warfare. And this guy's assignment is to keep Paul, the old man, because he was an old man. He was terribly beat up. It's kind of like if he runs, you could probably just grab him before he took the first step. But he ain't going nowhere. Where's he going to go? The Jews are waiting on him out there. So he's got this guard over him that this guy's on, I mean, this is a mall cop at this point. I mean, come on. So he's got his own security there. He wasn't with the rest of the prisoners. Where was he? Go down to verse 30. And Paul dwelt two whole years in his, uh, in his own hired house and received all that came unto him. Well, he wasn't locked up in the hardened part of prison. He had a hired house. Sounds like there was some kind of, yeah, under a house arrest situation. Yeah. I mean, they, you know, the ankle bracelets they put on now, tracking devices and all. He had a guard there. And he was free to receive whoever. They knew good and well this man wasn't a threat. They knew he wasn't going anywhere. Probably the greatest rest this guy had since he began his ministry. Got to heal up a little bit, and yet he received all that came to him. So he maintained the ministry when he was locked up. Now I hear all this stuff about Paul and how he died. You know, he was crucified like Jesus Christ. There's no account of that. He was crucified upside down like Peter. There's no account of that of Peter nor Paul. Well, he had his head chopped off. Well, there's no account of that. He dwelt two years in this house. 
my feelings is, he dwelt two years and died. And they buried him. Done. And he wrote great epistles out of prison. Some of the greatest epistles to us that are sitting here tonight. He wrote out of that prison, that hired house. And so he had this opportunity to preach to people. And it sounds pretty liberal. Uh, there wasn't any constraints there. Um, so Paul then was delivered from these Jews. They fell and then God foresaw that if the gospel that he preached went out to the Gentiles, God foresaw before the foundation of the world, the Jews fall, that if that gospel was brought out to the Gentiles, they would hear it and they would believe it. Look in, um, we'll stay in Acts 28. Ah, uh, let's see. Well, let's go to verse 17. We got a few minutes left. And it came to pass that after three days, Paul called the chief of the Jews together. And when they would come together, he said unto them, Men and brethren, though I have committed nothing against the people or customs of our fathers, yet was I delivered prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans, who, when they examined me, would have let me go, because there was no cause of death in me. They would have let me go. But when the Jews spake against it, I was constrained to appeal unto Caesar. Not that I had ought to accuse my nation of. In other words, I'm just saving my neck by going to Caesar. That's all. So for this cause, therefore, have I called for you to see you and to speak with you, because that for the hope of Israel I'm bound with this chain, the chain of prison. And they said unto him, We neither received letters uh, out of Judea concerning thee, neither any of the brethren that came showed or spake any harm of thee. But we desire to hear of thee what thou thinkest. For as concerning this sect, we know that everywhere it is spoken against. And when they had appointed him a day, there came many to him into his lodging, to whom he expounded and testified the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus both out of the law of Moses and out of the prophets, from morning till evening. And some believe the things which were spoken, and some believe not. And this is where the fork in the road is met. Verse uh, uh, where do I, uh, 25. And when they agreed not among themselves, they departed. After that, Paul had spoken one word, well spake the Holy Ghost by Isaiah the prophet unto our fathers, saying, Go unto this people, and say, Hearing ye shall hear, and shall not understand, seeing ye shall see, and not perceive. For the heart of this people is wax gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes have they closed, lest they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, should be converted, and I should heal them. That will not happen with the heart being wax gross, nor the eyes that are dull of hearing, nor the ears that hear but don't understand. Be it known, verse 28, be it known therefore unto you that the salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles and that they will hear it. And that's almost 1,900 years it's gone on, so God knew a thing or two, didn't he? And when he had said these words, the Jews departed and had great reasoning among themselves. And Paul dwelt two whole years in his own hired house and received all that came to him, preaching the gospel, the kingdom of God, and teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no man forbidding him. Rome powers gave him free hand. Do whatever you want, Paul. You're good to go. And so those Jews come there, and he spoke of the prophecy of uh, Isaiah, and that they would not see, hear, nor understand the things that he talked about. And at that point in Acts 28, he made that pro proclamation that the salvation of God is now sent to the Gentiles. And folks... There hadn't been another man of God sent to the Jews since then.
All your ministries have gone out through the Gentile people. And that's how it's going to go. And that's how this age is going to close out. It's going to close out with Gentiles being saved. Gentile preachers. Can a Jew get saved? Yes, he can. But pretty much, they're not going to believe. Because that's why they're where they're at today. That's why God isn't going to come and bail them out. That's why armies have marched in there and torn them down. That's why they are scattered throughout the world. If God protected them, none of that could have happened. But once they rejected the Apostle Paul, he had no other plan for them in this age. But he did have a plan to bring the salvation through Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, and they will hear it. And by that, we that are here that have trusted in Christ are an end result of God's foreknowledge that if the gospel came to you and you heard this truth, that Christ died for your sins, was buried and raised again the third day, and you trusted in that truth, you're saved. You're forgiven and saved. And that's gone on, as I said, about 1,900 years. So God had a plan. This still has not gotten to 2 Corinthians 4, verse 4 yet. So I think maybe next week we'll go through that. So anyhow, we've been about an hour. Let's close it. Bye. Thank you.